Whenever we talk about asymmetric encryption, we commonly talk about PGP, pretty good privacy. We may also hear someone refer to GPG. There's a relationship between these two. In 1991, Phil Zimmerman created PGP. It's become an extremely popular asymmetric encryption method that is used all over the world. And if you want to get some idea of his mindset when he created PGP, there is a document he wrote, Why I Wrote PGP. It's a nice essay. This is the URL. It makes for, for some interesting reading that gives you some insight as to why this was even created in the first place. This is commercial software. It's currently owned by Symantec. It's gone through many owners through the years, but currently Symantec is the organization that owns the commercial version of PGP. But PGP itself is an open standard, one called Open PGP. There's an RFC 4880 that was created with that standardization in there. And there is a piece of software that has been created based on that Open PGP standard called GNU Privacy Guard or GPG, which are the same letters just reversed. There are many versions of GNU Privacy Guard. You can find them for Linux, for Windows, for Mac OS, and for other operating systems as well. And one nice thing about it is it interacts very well. It's extremely compatible with the commercial version of PGP. So you could find somebody sending you a file that has been encrypted with the commercial version, and you'll almost always be able to decrypt that just fine with the open PGP version of this software. The actual encryption and decryption process using PGP can be somewhat difficult to do for someone who's never done this before. Obviously, our email clients don't usually have PGP or open PGP capabilities built right into the email client. So sometimes there's extra steps. You may have to get an add-on for your software to be able to do this. But you need that software, that PGP-compatible software on both sides of this conversation, one to encrypt the data and one to decrypt the data. If you've ever added an encryption certificate to a public web server, then you've probably gone to a third party and you've purchased an X509 compatible certificate to put on your web server. This X509 certificate was created by a third party. The third party checked and made sure the person requesting the certificate was legitimate, and they provided you with a certificate. And that way, anybody who comes to your web server sees that that certificate was one that was created by someone they trust. And in that way, people are able to use this encrypted method on your web server. PGP works a little bit differently. PGP has its own certificate standard called the PGP certificate. These are not X509 certificates. And one important aspect of this is that they use a web of trust. In a web of trust, we're creating our own certificate and we're having our friends vouch for us. The idea is that if I, we have a friend sign our certificate stating that we trust that this is James, then other people who know our friend can therefore also trust my certificate as well. You don't have to have this web of trust there, but it does make your certificates that more trustful in the eyes of the people who might be using it to encrypt data and send information to you. Sometimes you'll even have entire groups of people get together where you can meet someone in person, verify who they are, and then sign their certificate, these certificate signing parties. This is something very common to do at things like security conventions, where you get to meet people in person, and you can all sign off on everybody's certificate that you trust who they are. And that way, when you go back to your separate cities and you want to send information to somebody that is encrypted, you can trust that the signatures associated with that are actually valid. You actually met that person. You know the people that signed that particular person's certificate it, and therefore that web of trust is even stronger. You could also confirm these web certificates over the phone. If you know what somebody's voice is like, you know that you can trust who you're talking to over the phone. You could even compare the certificates themselves or even just the signature of those certificates, which are much smaller. It's a hash of the certificate, and therefore you can be assured that if, it, if the hash does match what is on your side from what that person is telling you, then you must have exactly the same certificate that they have. On my computer, I've loaded GPG, and I have this Mac-based front end, which is my keychain, where I can put in all of the different keys that I happen to use, and they're in one big keychain on my computer. It makes it very easy to manage through this front end. I've created a key for myself. It is james at professormesser.com. If you're running PGP or GPG, you can go out to the public key server. You will find my key there, and you can download that key onto your keychain so that you can encrypt data, send it to me, and then I can decrypt it 
it on this side. I created this key June 28, 2011. It is a 2048-bit key with the RSA algorithm. Here's the short ID of the key and a longer ID of the key. So you can verify the ID information. And there's the fingerprint. I might want to put my PGP key, public key, out on my web server along with this fingerprint so that people can verify when they put it into their key ring that the fingerprint that I created and put on my web server matches what they are seeing in their keychain. And they can have that assurance that what they're looking at really is the same public key on both sides. Let's have a look at more details. Let's get underneath this and let's look at both how we might create a key and then also look at what's created when we create that public key and that private key. Let's create a new key from scratch. So I'm going to go up to my menu up here and I'm going to choose the option to create and generate a new key. And in my new key pair, I can decide what I would like this to be. I can choose the key type that I will use. Let's use the default of the RSA and RSA key type. We can specify the length of the key that we might want to use. We can put an expiration on the key if we'd like to. And this is just going to be a test key. I'm not even going to share this with the key server that's out here. And let's give this an email of test at professormesser.com. And you can even add a comment to this that people would be able to see if they downloaded your public key. And this would also be something that you can have in your key ring to specify which key this is. You might have many, many keys associated with your persona. You can also separate them out into different functions. And maybe the comment field is what we would do. Let's create a key. And it says we need to generate a lot of random bytes, perform some other action, type on the keyboard move the mouse, use the disks. It's going to use a lot of different methods inside of your computer to try to create something that is truly random. So this goes beyond the standard randomization. On the other screen, it also says that I need to assign a passphrase to this particular key. This passphrase should be something that's relatively complex. That way, if somebody was to get your private key, they would still not be able to gain access to that private key. So let's type in something that is something you would never use, like passphrase, which is what I just typed in. And it even said that I have entered an insecure passphrase. It should contain at least one digit or a special character. That's OK. Take that one anyway. We're going to throw away this key once we're done. And I'm going to also put it in again just to make sure that I did it correctly. And now it's going to continue creating that key. And once we're done, let's look at the public key and the private key that we've created for this. And we'll see what we've got here. I'm going to right mouse click and export that key. And I'm going to put it in my documents directory. And we're going to call this the test key. And I'm also going to allow the secret key to be exported, which normally you would not do unless you were really wanting to move this to another computer. Obviously, you would never give your secret key to anyone else. And let's save that. Now let's see what these look like. There are two keys now in this file that I've created. The first one starts with this message, begin PGP public key block. And I'm going to arrow down. All of this text that you see in here is the key. So all of this obviously very randomized, not really something that looks like anything we could easily recreate. And there is the end of the key. Now also in this file, because I specified to send the private key, here's the private key that was created. If we were to put these public key and private key right next to each other, you would notice that they are very, very different. And that's by design. You don't want your public key to look anything like your private key. And of course, as I mentioned, you would really never be exporting your private key unless we were moving this to another computer. Again, your private key is something you should keep very close to you. You should not share this with anyone. So in this case, this isn't something you would normally do. But I wanted you to see the difference or even some of the similarities between both the public key and the private key. Now that we've created that private key and the public key for our test user, let's try encrypting a document with the public key and decrypting it with our private key. So I have a file ready to go. It's called test.txt. There it is. And the only thing in this test.txt file is this this information, this is a test file. It's the only sentence that's in there. It's the only thing in the file. So a very simple file to check to see if we're going to be able to encrypt this and decrypt this properly. So now let's do the actual encryption process. We use GPG to do this. And I'm going to specify an output file of this. We'll call this test.encrypt. 
And I'm going to also specify that this is an encryption process. And I'm going to specify the recipient. C-I-P-I-E-N-T is test at professormesser.com. And then I'm going to specify the file I want encrypted, which is test.txt. Now, I did all of this on the command line. I had to remember all of these different command uh, command parameters. I've got them on a separate page over here so I can reference and type and talk to you at the same time. You can see it's a little bit complicated to do this at the command line. It can be automated. A lot of the times, you have plugins into your email application. You have a plugin into your browser that allows you to do all of this in a more graphical form. But as you can see, there are extra steps involved to make this happen. Now, if I typed all this in correctly and I hit Enter, I've already got a test.encrypt file that I was running earlier. And I do want to overwrite that. So now let's see what it looks like, test.encrypt. And we can see that the file itself, a little bit different than this is a test file, isn't it? So that's what we would now send to a third party and say, here's the file. It's all encrypted. It's all yours. Now let's pretend we're at the recipient's computer. And we've received the file. And we've saved it on our hard drive. Now we would only be able to decrypt this, of course, with the private key. So let's try this. Let's do the GPG command. And we're going to specify here that we're going to choose the output of where we would like this file to go. Let's call this the test.decrypt file. And I do want to do a decrypt on it. So let's specify that in the command line. And let's specify the name of the file that we would like to have decrypted, which is test.decrypt. Encrypt, that's the encrypted information. Let's hit Enter. And it says, you need a passphrase to unlock the secret key for test key. And one of the things that I've already done previously, I've already used this in the last five minutes. So my key is already cached on this computer. So it says that this was encrypted with a 2048-bit RSA key ID 371C1236. So you can now verify all these things if you'd like. And the name that's on this is the test key, test at professormesser.com. And now let's see if it actually decrypted it properly. Let's look at our test.decrypt. This is a test file. So our decryption process did run properly. So now we've gone through that process. We built some keys. We have a public key and a private key. We encrypted something with our public key. We now decrypted it with our private key. So we know that that asymmetric encryption process is working exactly the way it should be. And now we should be able to send encrypted information between point A and point B.